Welcome to the Mom and Dot 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 podcast. We're your hosts, Suzanne Kearns and Missy Stevens. We want to help you through everything that happens in the ellipses, from your professional life to your emotional health. You're a mom and so much more. Let's figure out what comes next together. Welcome to the Mom and Dot 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 podcast. I'm Suzanne Kearns, Mom and Dot 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 writer, LGBTQ and sex ed advocate. And today I am a returner of all the Christmas presents that didn't fit. So it's just a <laughs> warning. I think end of January is the it's return time. policy for most places. So get going. <laughs> and I'm Missy Stevens, Mom and Dot 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 writer, foster child advocate. And this week, 49 year old. I'm officially oh, in my 50 birthday. before 50 countdown. Oh, you're, you're almost Here caught up to me. Almost. <laughs> All right. Um, well, we are so excited. We have Erin Pepler with us today. Erin is a freelance writer who lives in the greater Toronto area with her husband and two kiddos. Her work has appeared in Romper, Today's Parent, Chatelaine. Is that correct? Chatelaine. Yeah, Chatelaine. Say it with a French accent. Yeah, Chatelaine. <laughs> Don't edit that in. <laughs> <laughs> totally staying in. <laughs> <laughs> Money Sense, Best Health, Reader's Digest, Broadview Magazine, and more. Aaron's first book, Send Me Into the Woods Alone, Essays on Motherhood, was featured in the Globe and Mail, CBC Books, and the Toronto Star, and Quill Inquire, and Publishers Weekly. When she isn't making her kids lunches or venting about politics on Twitter, Aaron is working on her second collection of essays. We are so glad you're here. Yay. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, well, we are so excited to talk to you. And I think we have actually referred to you a couple of times on the show as the person who saved me at the Mom 2 conference yep. with the, with the I like stain pen. That's yes. my legacy, and I'm going to hold on to it because it was like our meet cute, and I'm going to hold on to it forever. I have, yes. I have this meet cute with Suzanne that I'm just I... always going to reference. So, yeah, you keep yes. using it too. I will also. <laughs> Rescued from the raspberry compote disaster oh, of whatever God. year that was i, don't I mean know i literally was. 10 minutes in those white pants and then bloop, yes. just a giant stain and so. i remember that i was sitting behind wendy aaron and i was very nervous because i had just come out of you know being home with my kids for a long time and i was just getting yeah. back into writing and i'm like i'm gonna go to this conference it's like you know far away like i live in toronto it was i think in pasadena that year maybe yes mm -hmm. i think you're right uh, and so i'm like out in california feeling awkward and feeling like i just got back into writing should i even be here and i was recognizing a lot of people and then i recognized you and i was like oh i think i'll say hi later and then you burst through with this stain on your pants and i was like this is my in and i walked over like i'm gonna be a hero <laughs> you were you, you were a hero it gets brought up at least once a month in some place. Yes. Uh, so thanks to so you and to Tide. So to, what do they even call that? Tide stain pen or whatever? Oh, time. Why don't we have a sponsorship? Is what I, I want to know. know. Yeah, brought to you by. <laughs> yeah. yeah, since that day, I've always had one. So yes, we do have one. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. But yeah, so we learned a little bit about you through your bio. And well, we've learned a lot about you because we've already read your book and we hope everybody yeah. else will too. Thank but uh, for those who haven't, can you give a little Erin 101 about where your career started and how you've got to where you are today? Yeah. I mean, if you want to kind of start back with where the career started, I mean, I've been writing for as long as I can remember. Like I was the kid who would write stories and then the teenager that would write stories. And then oh. when it came to go to school, to university, I thought I want to be either a lawyer or a writer. And my very logical brain was like, I don't think I can make money as a writer. So I'm going to take law. So I studied law for four years in university, but I kept freelancing and I kept trying to get articles. And by the time I graduated after four years of university, I had a job offer with a magazine and I just never did anything in the legal profession whatsoever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and it was that's undergraduate awesome. law. It's not like I had a law degree. Yes, um, but still, but that's, I, a, that's good knowledge to have under your belt in case. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was something that I was, I just loved doing and I loved learning, but I couldn't get away from the writing because it just felt like the thing I was meant to be doing. And even if I wasn't getting paid for it, I was going to be writing anyway, because it's mm -hmm. something that I just feel compelled to do a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go, you know, what the hell, give it a try. Let's see if I can actually make this a career. But then I had babies almost immediately after university. So I had my first daughter. I got pregnant when I was 25. Um, oh, wow. And my second child I had when I was 27. And then there was a couple of years where I was freelancing, but it was pretty light because I was really in the trenches of you know, babies uh -huh. and toddlers. Yeah. So I don't feel like I started my 
career in earnest till I was closer to 30. Because here, I, I think it's different where you guys are, but here in Ontario, your child starts junior kindergarten the year they're turning four. So my son has okay. a late October birthday. So he was three years and like 10 months old. He wasn't even four years old and he was in full-time school. So oh, when wow. he went to full-time school, that's when I started my career back up again. I just kind of kept a toe in the yes. water for those years before that. But yeah, and then it just yeah. kind of snowballed. I kind of dived into it and suddenly it was like articles and I just wrote whatever I wanted and things were getting picked up and a couple things went viral on Scary Mommy, which was very helpful. Thank goodness really... for Scary Mommy. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple of articles that went really big there, um, especially that being a US audience was very helpful. And then I got a yeah. book deal and here I am. And that really oversimplifies it. But, you know, there's a lot of hard work. <laughs> Right. The, the short and sweet version is like articles did well. I got a book deal. Here we are. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, sign me up. <laughs> I know. I know. We know that in between there is a lot. We know as moms and yeah. as writers, no. like it's there's a long road in between that. Thankfully, it resulted in to send me into the woods alone because oh, that book. Like yes. as a mom, spoke to both of our souls. We agree with your Thank hate you. of shoots and ladders. Like, <laughs> It is the hated. worst game in the whole oh world. God. I hated it as a kid and I hate it now. It can't be called a game if there's no way to strategize and actually win it. It is just like a cycle of torture. That's yes. true. I agree yes, with that. It causes children to cry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you can't teach them how to win. You can't teach no, them how to do no. it better. Because no. it's garbage. But <laughs> it's garbage. You're going to get what you get. Well, maybe that's what it teaches you. You get what this you get. This show is brought to you, <laughs> you by Shoots and Ladders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think maybe we might get tied pins. We're not going to get shoots and ladders. <laughs> no, no, no. They don't want to. No. We don't want them. No, and I, I can remember having small children and being in the weeds and wishing for like a tiny illness. Nothing major, like maybe one night in the hospital. Like, <laughs> That's I not a just... tiny illness. <laughs> I know. I know. I mean, I would try to rationalize it in my head. Like, what could it be that would be sick enough that I could get the hell out of here for 24 hours, but not sick enough to scare anybody? You, yes. know? Like, you need like yeah. a rash I've heard or that something. from other people too. Yeah, yeah I've heard a yeah. lot of people say like, what if I just, you know, hurt myself just a little where a little. I you know I'd recover, I'd be just fine, broke my but foot. it had to stay overnight. Like, yes. Yes. you know. So we really, we really get it. And I love wanting to go to a cabin in the woods that is somehow perfectly clean, but also rustic and out of the way. Um, exactly. It's mythical so are cabin. you hearing from other readers that this is a common theme? I'm hearing it so much. And what's interesting to me is that when I put the book out, I thought there's going to be people where the book really resonates with them. They're like, I totally get this. And there's going to be people who are like, oh, like this is not how I felt yeah. or what I feel, but like, cool, sure, whatever. And of course, right. people don't like it because nobody likes everything. Right. No book is universally loved, but I'm getting so much of the former. Like everything I'm hearing from people is just about how, even if the whole book didn't resonate, parts of it did. And it's always the parts that are a little bit shameful, a little embarrassing. You <laughs> feel like you're the only one that feels that way. Like I, you can tell funny anecdotes and you can say whatever you want about, you know, this this experience you go through having little kids and having babies. But right. if you really dig into the parts where you're like, I feel like I'm the only one, like, I don't want to say that because I feel like I'm the only one that experienced that. That's, I think, where people actually really, really connect with you. So I kind of knew there'd be a little of that. I'm shocked by how much of it there is. And I think it just kind of speaks to how much we don't talk about certain things and how much we should right. talk about certain things. Right. I personally loved your section on self-care and Thank Missy you. and I always say that there's every every episode we have a thing we need to put into a needle point on a pillow. <laughs> but <laughs> this idea, and I never really, I mean, I guess I kind of thought about it, but I'd never read it written this way about it. treating ourselves well should not mean having to spend money. Participating in capitalism isn't self-care. And I was just like, I love that. And and you do get into the idea that self-care wasn't always about like taking bubble baths. It actually comes from a whole different yeah. historical place. Absolutely. And it really was something, and I mean, like just for clarification, like I am a middle-class white woman and this self-care, like originally, it really came from this political place where black women in particular had to use self-care as this like act of preservation. And this is where you get into like what Audre Lorde was writing and all of these things where it's mm -hmm. not getting your nails done. It's not like anything you can buy at a store, it's this radical act of taking care of yourself because you need to, because it's survival. Mm -hmm. So it's so kind of ghastly to me that it's become this thing where it's like white lady wine brunch 
You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And that self care, um, right. because there's nothing wrong with like, I love to go get a manicure. I love to go get a massage. I will sit and read a book. I'll have a bubble bath. Like I do all those things, but they're not solving my problems. Like those are nice little moments I make for myself. And I'm not against mm-hmm. doing that. Like, I want to make it clear, like do those things. If you enjoy them, like we absolutely all should do things that bring us a moment of joy or peace or calm or whatever, mm-hmm. but that's different than having self-care in the form of like setting boundaries and having a community around yourself and kind of like getting into like activism and stuff like that, where we're thinking of like care for entire communities, how we benefit greater groups of people and helping each other. And it, they're just completely wildly different things. So yes. not that's yeah. bad to get a manicure. Just yeah. if you get a manicure and you think it's self-care, then you're like, why is my life still hard? It's because that's not self-care. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. That right. I mean, is such an important way of looking at it because all of the things that we typically think of as self-care are more just self-distraction from yeah. something Ooh. that is definitely going to still be there the, you know, when we get back. Um, may yeah, just yeah. take our mind off of it for a while, which, like you said, is an important thing. Is we deserve sure. to we deserve to be distracted yeah. every once in a while from yeah. things that are driving us crazy. Yeah. But so, what does that look like for you in the true sense of self care? Then, for actually taking care of the things that need to be taken care of, not just distracting yourself from them. Do you have any practices that you do in your life around that? You know, it's hard because like every mom, like I do feel that there's times where I'm like, oh, I am killing it. And then there's times where I'm like, oh, I'm so overwhelmed. I'm such a, I'm doing such a bad job of this because mm-hmm. everything ebbs and flows and depends on what's going yes. on in your life, what's going on in your kids' lives. Um, mm-hmm. I think the best thing I've done is to build a really good community around me and to learn to kind of accept help because mm-hmm. I'm very good at offering help. I'm very good at being like, oh, I'll, I'll drive your kids out from that party and oh, I'll you know, drop off that meal because you're sick and I'll do that thing. But then when I need help, I'm very bad at either asking for it or accepting it. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I think the best thing I've done is be like, oh, it's okay for this to be this like mutual helping of each other and community building. And just like, you know, everyone talks about the village and I know it's become very cliche, but like actually participating in that in a meaningful way, Mm -hmm. that's been very, very helpful to me. So, and I know it's easier for some people than others because it depends on where you live and who you have around you. Like I live on a court full of young families and I've built really good friendships with people who live within, you know, 200 meters of my house. Mm -hmm. So that's very different than if you're really isolated because there's a community of people who are kind of mentally and emotionally supporting you, but there's Mm -hmm. something to be said for someone who can go, oh, hey, I'll just pick that up for you while I'm out at the store. And like, oh, can you pick up my kids on the birthday party, but I'll drive yours there. And just like everybody lightening each other's load a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you actually, I mean, you have an essay about having to create that for yourself and identifying that you didn't have that when you moved out of the city to the first house in the Mm -hmm. suburbs where it was a little too (laughs) suburby for for being the suburbian Uh, yes and and realizing that yeah even though the next house is still in the suburbs it gives you access to this community or at least the potential for a community Mm -hmm. which again as uh, i think we all come from a place of privilege where that's even an option to be like oh well this one didn't quite do it i'm gonna move to the next one but i yeah i'm I'm hopeful that any listener that whatever case they're in they can hear that message of finding the community wherever you are and being able to accept help i think that's such a key key thing for Mm -hmm. i love that concept of participating in the community Mm -hmm. so you're accepting help and you're giving help and it is a mutual thing that you helps you build this uh, and don't feel guilty about it like I used to feel a little guilty or even when I didn't feel guilty I would think like oh I was you know sick and that friend knew it and they dropped off some soup for me and mentally I'd have this thing like next time they're sick I need to drop off soup for them Mm -hmm. because I have to repay the favor and Mm -hmm. it's not always like that right you help each other sometimes more and sometimes they're helping you more and sometimes you're really stepping up so I mean there's been times where I've had a friend with a critically ill parent and I've stepped up a lot to help them And I'm not keeping score like they owe me now, but for some reason, when the roles are reversed, if someone's helping me a lot, I have, I get the mindset of like, how can I return this favor? So I have to get out of that because I think over time, everything balances out. And that's like what friendship is, right? You're not keeping score. You're not keeping tabs. You're just, like I said, participating in a community. But if you're someone like me, who's really independent and feels really much like I shouldn't need help, it's easier to give the help than to receive it for sure. Yeah. I'm much better at giving than receiving. (laughs) Yeah. It's awkward. A lot of women are. 
I yeah. mean, that's how I we're think we need to know train, that about right? each other. Like if we just yeah. accept that and be like, I know this is hard for you, but I'm going to do this. Exactly. Uh, thinking about that guilt and acceptance of things, we really thought it was so relatable that your deepest shame was being bored with momming. Mm. I think a lot of people feel that. I definitely have felt that. What did that look like for you? How did you know, or how did you begin to accept that you were bored and what did you do about it? So it was mostly the kind of baby toddler years where I'm used to being very go, go, go. And mm -hmm. I had my kids and I had them back to back. My kids are 19 months apart and I loved mothering. And I really do. Like I'm a nurturing person. I feel like the mothering came really naturally to me. And so that's part of what was complicated about it. it. It wasn't like, I'm like, oh, motherhood doesn't right fit. Or I feel unnatural as a mom right. or I'm just bored. And I'm not sure if I should have had kids. It was none of that. I was so thrilled to have children. Mm -hmm. All I'd ever wanted to be a mom was it felt so natural but then it'd be like the middle of a long afternoon and I'd be like, oh my God, like there's so many hours. Like, what do I do? Um, <laughs> like, you know, the, it's just me and these like babies. And so, yes. and I'd love them to pieces, but I'd be like, oh my God, what are we going to do every day all afternoon? So the thing oh, I that the I panic did. panic so well. Yeah. Oh, you're like, it's only one o'clock. <laughs> exactly. It's counting the hours so your partner gets home because right. for me, my partner. And you've lived three lifetimes. Oh. Yeah. And it's one o'clock. Like, oh, yes. Exactly. And you're like, just tap in so I can go do something with my brain because so much mm -hmm. of uh, that early motherhood is like repetitive, right? Like you're diapering, you're feeding, you're making sure they're napped, you're making sure they're clean and fed, you're doing all this, you're playing with them. And I have a whole essay, not in the book, but uh, that was in Scary Mommy about how I'm really, I don't like playing with my kids, <laughs> which was another source of guilt. Like I love baking with them, reading to them, taking them to the park, uh, playing board games with them, like spending time with them. But if you give me like a little figurine, oh, um, no. and we're like, let's play like an imaginary game. Or if like mm -hmm. my daughter was like, Hey, can you be this character? And I'm this character, like my brain immediately like shut down. I was like, no. I don't want to do that. I am not <laughs> but I would on do the it. floor with the dolls. I just yeah. no, it never, and I never want stuck. to be, and I'm just not. No, and it's okay, but it made me feel like a really bad mom. But anyway, yeah, back to the boredom, it was kind of like, for me, what I did was I had to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be with my kids. I wanted to spend time with them. I wanted to be a mom, but I did not want to be just home all day filling the hours. And so mm -hmm. when my babies were little, we still lived in downtown Toronto and I would put them in a double stroller and I would go out every day, at least once a day, if not twice a day for a long walk. And I would run errands with them. I would sometimes like when I had just my one baby, it's like, you can take them for a walk and you can go to like an art gallery or you can walk around and do some shopping or you can do whatever mm -hmm. and have this little baby with you. If you're lucky like me and had a baby who could like sleep in a stroller and you could still get and do that stuff. And just the act of being like, you know what, I'm going to go out, I'm going to grab a coffee. I'm going to wander around the neighborhood and do some people watching. I used to sometimes bring a book in the good weather and my baby would fall asleep and I would sit at a park and read a book because that to me was nicer than sitting at home on my couch. Mm -hmm. So yes. for me, per I know it's different for everyone, but for me personally, getting out of my house is what kept me feeling like an adult and not like Absolutely. just a caregiver, like an adult mm -hmm. in the world yeah. who was seeing other adults and interacting with people and still thinking my thoughts and observing the world around me versus like this really isolated caregiver where all day I was just meant to like take care of babies. Mm -hmm. Even oh. though I love those babies to bits. I know. <laughs> I, and I wish someone oh, would have yeah. told me that. I don't know why I felt like I had to be at home. Like I took the stay at home <laughs> yeah. mom thing really exactly. literally. We stay yeah. at home. <laughs> No, because I remember because I took my four months off and then my husband took three months off with our first daughter. And I remember, I mean, he went, it has still scarred him, I think, to this day where, I mean, he's still, our kids are like heading off to college and he's like, mm -hmm. I appreciate you. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, just those three months at home. And he, I think, yeah. took our daughter to the zoo maybe every day just because he's like, if I am in this house for another second, I will go crazy. And I think that was my problem. And I don't know, I think it was a little postpartum anxiety. I think I always was really worried about like, okay, well, what if we go somewhere and then she has a total meltdown and we have to come back and what a waste of time mm -hmm. that would be. Or like, what if she goes somewhere and we have a blowout or what if, uh, there was a lot of what ifs and it just seemed a lot safer and easier for everyone if we would just stay close to the crib in case. And I was really insane about like, oh, I mean, naps too. and that kind of thing. Yeah. 
So that always made a cutoff point too, because you're like, oh, if we have to be back at one for this perfect nap time that the book says, then I can't start anything past this time. And, you know, I can't get here and back. And I also had a really weird thing. I did have postpartum anxiety with driving. Um, mm-hmm. So I, for some reason, I couldn't drive anywhere that were bridges, which is really fun in Seattle when like everything, ready to say, everything is a bridge to somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> See, we lived in West Seattle where the only way you could get to the city is over a big ass bridge. Um, So yeah, so we didn't go too many places. And I think you're right. I think that was my problem is that I didn't have that even if you're not talking to another adult, at least you're surrounded by other in humans. the world. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're you still feel like you're participating in the world. And I remember sometimes I would go out and I'd be met with like nothing but random criticism. That would be my conversation for the day because I was 26 when my daughter was born and I looked really young. And so I would be out there with like my York U hoodie on. Like I just graduated a couple of years ago from university and I had my little baby with me. And a lot of people thought it was a nanny. We had a lot of conversations where people would ask me, like, did I have hours available? Was I full time with the family? <laughs> oh my and I'd be like, God. Oh, no, this is yeah, full time like, this- with this family. <laughs> yeah, I'm like super full time. I'm pregnant again. Um, but it, so it was kind of weird. Um, and in downtown Toronto, like the cost of living is really high. So if you go to a play group during the day, at least in the neighborhood I lived in, it was a lot of like, it was nannies with children because there weren't a lot of stay-at-home moms in my neighborhood. I know that's not the same in every neighborhood in Toronto, but where I was living at the time, it was like, I'd be the mom with the kids. And then there was a lot of nannies with the kids. So I did like hang out with the nannies and vibe with them. But it would be (laughs) funny too, because I remember being in Starbucks and just like waiting in the line. And both my kids were born kind of close to winter. And so they're like bundled up in like little snowsuits. And I'd pop into Starbucks and grab a coffee. And there'd immediately be like some person, 10 or 20, 30 years older than me who would go, your baby's going to overheat. You need to like start un- like blanketing oh, them. I'd be like, well, I'm what? in and out. Like I'm going to be in and out in like four minutes. I think it's fine. Like they're not going to overheat in four minutes. And then the same thing would happen. Like I would see a long line and be like, okay, so I am going to kind of remove a blanket or two or whatever. And someone would lean over and go like, that's not enough layers on your baby. Oh, the generation of older than us is obsessed with baby temperatures. Absolutely. <laughs> Socks, hats, blankets, like they're a yeah. people. Like they feel like we do. And I wonder too, because I got a little, even when I was pregnant, like I have a story, I think it's in my book. I remember being like eight months pregnant and coming out of the hospital and getting a cab because I was like too pregnant to feel, I was so nauseous. I'm like, I'm not taking the subway today. I'm taking a cab. And I got in the cab and the cab driver looked at my belly and looked at me and was like, I hope that baby has a real father. And I was like, oh Oh my Um, gosh. I do feel like it's funny. I don't have tangent now, but there's almost like a second layer of like parenting in public, but also parenting in public while young or at least young appearing. Yes, I guess so. I would, I did not have that problem. See, I was the opposite. (laughs) I was the quote unquote geriatric. Right. I was geriatric. Yeah. Geriatric. Which is very common now. And the term is awful because you guys were probably a very normal age to have a child. (laughs) I remember when I saw it on my chart and I was like, oh my God. Yeah. And you're what, like 35? Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's ridiculous. But that's so interesting because I have never, never had any comment like that. Mm -hmm. And I bet it is. I bet it was the difference of a youthful versus a geriatric mom. (laughs) I don't know. I got, I was old and I got comments all the time. Lots of, lots of little unsolicited advice about all kinds of things. I must just have a face that says, don't even try with me because maybe because I have a face. It's like, just talk to me. And tell me yeah. your opinions. Or maybe it's just because I didn't leave the house. Yeah, nobody could speak to you. No one came into my house to nitpick how I was parenting. So weird how that happened. <laughs> oh my God, that's probably it. Yeah, you just didn't see any people. I never got any comments from anyone because I oh, didn't man. leave the house. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh, but when you were, yeah, the chapter about the boredom, all I could remember was just laying there on a beanbag, getting covered with just Melissa and Doug meals that my son Mm -hmm. would bring me. And he'd be like, here's the hot dog in the teacup. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what would you like now? And just the act of having to come up with something like I'll have a cookie in a hamburger bun, like, oh, (laughs) and just being done with it and but you know but then also this podcast and the book i'm working on is hoping to encourage moms to use some of that time to find things to 
like re-energize their brain. But mm -hmm. the more I go back to that place, I'm like, okay, is that physically possible to shift gears from just mind numbing Melissa and Doug wooden toys mm -hmm. covering mm -hmm. you to like, mm -hmm. oh, the kid's taking a nap. So now I'm going to be totally intellectually engaged in this, you know, special project yeah. I'm working on. Like, did you, uh, you did do a little bit more of the back yeah, and I forth did. of that. So like, well, how was that transition for you? So like, yes and no, I feel like yes, in the sense that I worked part time the whole time. Like I, in addition to like, um, like editorial stuff in the book, like I do a lot of copywriting and just like full disclosure. I feel like I, I like to be honest with people. That's because if you want to make a decent income, like writing magazine articles and having a book out is not going to like, you know, pay a mortgage. So I also do no. a lot of copywriting, like secretly, <laughs> secretly yeah. and quietly. So I can remember having my first baby and like, I was finishing up edits on a project. So she's like days old. I was sitting there with my laptop balanced kind of on my knee and she was nursing. And I'm like, typing with one hand and just like finishing stuff. So I never really stopped working, but that was like copywriting, which is a different part of my brain. Like I can do that pretty, like I can mm -hmm. just go into work mode and do it. And I'm not yep. really using my brain the same way I would be if I'm like writing something personal, like a personal essay or writing mm -hmm. like an op-ed piece or anything like that. So I know I would say like, oh, I really want to work on this book because I had the idea for this book when my kids were toddlers. And I think I started writing notes actually when my daughter was a baby. I write some of the infant notes, things I wanted to write about at one point. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually start writing it till my younger child was six. And the reason for that is because like, when, when would I have had the space? I had hours in the day where I could sit at a computer. That's different from having the space to be with your thoughts and think things out and yes. get them on paper and start to really sit with them and expand upon them. Like you need time and they, like that's the whole cabin in the woods thing. Like the whole mm -hmm. like send me away. You really need, somebody told me, another writer, and I wish I could credit the person appropriately because I think this person heard it from someone else. But they said, you know, writing a book is really having a conversation with yourself and oh. you need the quiet and the space mm -hmm. and the time to be able to do that. So you can't do that at nap yeah. time. Or at least I couldn't. I mean, I'm sure right. there's, I know there's people who get up at 5 a.m. and they write for an hour and then they start their day. I can't do that. I need to kind of yeah. binge write. So mm -hmm. I would not be able to like put my child down from a nap and then be like, okay, I've got 90 minutes and suddenly crank out an essay because I'm like, no, no, no. I need to really like get in my head and think about this and let the thoughts kind of like trickle out as they do or like come out, sometimes come out quickly. But you can't always control. This sounds very like, Oh, I'm a writer, but you know what I mean? Like, you can't <laughs> right. always control when like the words like hit you, like yes. you can sit at a computer and it's just not coming out it just or you happen. can be like, oh, unless you're happening. Stephen happening. King. Yeah, exactly. So, I like, know there course, are people like, who train themselves to do that. I haven't done it yet. I don't know if I'll ever be that person because I agree. I feel like I need this space and I need I need time to like warm up almost like writing foreplay. Like I need yeah. a little, yeah. some stuff has to go <laughs> like on that. before I'm like, time. boom. Yeah. 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 And it yeah. never worked for me in nap time. Cause I'm like, well, as soon as I get going, then nap time would be over. My thing is exactly. my brain doesn't give me permission to get going. If I'm worried that there's going to be an interruption. Yeah. That too. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like, I can't let go of the idea of these sunk costs of like, oh, I, I, it took all this time for the foreplay. <laughs> And then <laughs> if I get interrupted, then yeah, I'm just over. like, I'm just mad. And I just yeah, feel I mean, like, well, I could have been just watching TV during that time instead of like opening yeah, up all the the dishwasher. Yeah. yeah. You just summed up uh, every nap time of my children's young lives because I would, I knew if I would start any kind of project and they would interrupt me that it would just be frustrating to me. Yes. So well, instead I wasted so a lot like, of damn time. Yeah. Yeah. That's why so many of us like stare at our phones, like yeah. when our kids are napping, right? Because yeah. it's like, you don't want to invest in a nap because that was my thing. People would say, sleep when the baby sleeps. I'm like, why? So I can lie down and it's going to take me half an hour to fall asleep because I'm so like, this mm -hmm. is not a time that I've, you know, mm -hmm. I'm normally sleeping and I'm just, I can't just lie down because I sleep. I mean, it'd be amazing if I could. <laughs> and so I'm like, why would I lie down, give myself 10 minutes maybe, and then have to be jolted awake and be groggy? And yeah, so right. it was kind of the same with writing where I'm like, if I don't know, there's going to be like a decent payoff or at least a decent chunk of time to accomplish this well, then it becomes frustrating and it makes my day worse rather than better. So how do we I do write a lot that? at night. How do we fix that? Yeah, no, that was what I was seriously like, how? What yes. do we do? 
I yeah, think I wish I had an I, answer. I know, <laughs> yeah, that's get older. How do we fix it? <laughs> <laughs> you let your kids grow. That's what yes. I well, does and help. Any, anybody who knows me back from when my daughter was little is probably like throwing things at their iPhone right now because my daughter used to take these mega naps from like one or two until six. She would get up and what? eat dinner and go to bed. And so I, I actually got a part-time job for a while at this place, Julep. I was doing some like wedding party organizations and like some of their marketing at home because I was like, what am I going to do with all this time when she was yeah. napping? So, I, I mean, my kids were good nappers at oh like no, two to Zoe three hours. was like, that's why I still make that girl breakfast every morning. <laughs> she earned <laughs> it. That's amazing. <laughs> but like good for you for getting a job because like not only, it's not even about money necessarily. It's about like you got to engage that adult part of your brain on a regular mm -hmm. basis. Yes. And I'm sure that was so good for your mental health to have something where it was like, a task and it's a grown up task and I did it and I did it well. And now it, that's satisfying. Yes. And then you go back yeah. to being a mom and it's a really nice balance. And this is not to shame people who aren't working outside of the no. house, because honestly, I worked very lightly for a couple of years when I had like yeah. two babies back to back. And I think that if you're happy staying home and you don't need or want a job outside the home, like parenting yeah. is obviously a full-time job, but for people who do work outside the home and parent, it's really nice to have that balance sometimes because it's as much as it's hard. Also, it's really great to use both sides of your brain mm -hmm. um, because yes. I know parenting is a ton of work, but I feel like it is a different type of ton of work than maybe having a job outside the home. And I always felt like they were two completely different parts of my brain working. Especially so when they're really young. Or, mm -hmm. when they're really young. It's very physical. You know, you're just like, yeah. it's a lot of just keeping them from killing themselves by falling off of things and mm -hmm. changing diapers and yeah, playing food or whatever it is you're doing. It's very physical. As they get older, there's a lot more to the mental game of it, but yeah, you're not doing a lot of like, it's, it's formulaic, I guess is what I'm mm -hmm. looking it's for. It's formulaic, like, but it's, it's also like all encompassing because it's like, you yes. cannot go pee without thinking, are my children safe? Like, are they right? okay? Can I leave them in? I the still space leave the door cracked. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I do too. Like, I, I can't go to other people's okay, houses, and I'm like, close the door, Missy. Close the door. <laughs> My family is so disturbed by me because I still just leave the door open when I go, and I think it is. It's burned That's into so my funny. brain, like just yes. in case anyone calls for me, yeah, someone might cry. Oh, they're 17 now, but no, you never know. In case you hear a thud and have to go, like, what did they walk into, or like whatever the case may be. But yeah, like it's as much as we talk about like boredom. And monotony and I can't say monotony it, it's also just so all-encompassing right because mm -hmm. it is a boredom but also the greatest responsibility because you're just like like I said you can't even pee without thinking if I go to the other room for two minutes is someone gonna hurt themselves yeah, <laughs> or yes. like you know need me whereas when you're at work it's kind of like you can go get a coffee. You can use the bathroom by yourself. You can go have lunch with a coworker and you have different mental demands because you know, you've got like obligations at work and things you've got to perform, but they did feel completely like different parts of my brain. So now yeah. you, it sounds like you've been jotting notes then for this book for a long, long time. For when, you so actually, long. when you actually sat down to write it, like what did that process look like then? Great so um what was kind of funny is I had so many notes because I thought I started writing them down when my daughter was a baby and I just had a, a word file on my computer it was even before like a google doc and I would make notes about this is a thing that has struck me as interesting I'm going to mm -hmm. write about it later and then when I went to write the actual book I abandoned a lot of it because I had perspective I had different mm -hmm. I had time right so it's different writing as the mother of an infant who has an infant currently versus when I started writing the book, my kids were six and eight. And when the book came out, they were 10 and eight. So that space and time and reflection, I think that really mm -hmm. changed what I wrote. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. Yeah. Cause I feel it really been differently different about, book. yeah. But like if I had written it when they were little, little. Nuts really. and bolts wise, then does this, it sounds like you do a lot of your writing work at night, at least based on yeah. the essays from your book. So is it mm -hmm. like a couple hours a day? Was it during the weekends? Like, and then no. what, what did you do? Who watched your kids? Isn't the world's most annoying, <laughs> the world's most annoying yeah. question for oh, a mom, God, but like what, how I did know, you then carve out that, that space that you need? 
you're writing for okay. today. <laughs> so I feel like I need to preface this by saying, number one, I'm a weirdo with really weird sleep habits. I've always had trouble sleeping. I'm a night person, not a morning person. And number two, I have really great privilege in the sense that I am married and I'm like, you know, in a decent place financially, mm -hmm. like, you know, not wealthy, but like I'm able to like escape a little. Um, so what I would do is I would say to my husband, like the very first time I wrote what I did was say to my husband, I want to write this book for real. And I don't think I can do it at home, or at least I don't think I can get started at home. I need to like go away and I need to be alone with my thoughts. And I want to see if I can write it. I don't even know if I can, but I want to try. And he's like, do it, just go. So I went on like hot wire. <laughs> Again, we should get a sponsorship. Um, <laughs> but I went on hot wire and I picked an affordable hotel and I booked it for two nights. And I was just like, okay, bye. And my kids were six and eight. So it was totally fine to leave them, which is also fine to leave them for six months and eight months. But you know what I mean? Absolutely, I didn't yes. feel as bad about it. And my husband was just like, we'll be fine. Uh, good luck. And he goes, no pressure. Just good luck. And I was like, no, there's so much pressure because I'm <laughs> paying money to go away to write. And yeah. he's like, no like, just go do it. It's like, this is what you've wanted to for a long time. Don't put pressure on yourself, just relax and see what happens. And so that was a huge privilege is like to have a partner who was like, just go mm -hmm. do it and spend the money and go away and I'll take care of the kids and it will be fine. So I went away that weekend and I wrote so much, like so much. <laughs> and then I'd come home and not touch the book for like a month because I was yeah. back thrown into working full time and taking mm -hmm. care of my kids and my mm -hmm. family and life is crazy. So then I'd say to my husband again, like, I think I'm just going to like go away for a weekend. The other thing I would do is my mom owns a small business and it would be empty at night. She had an office that was empty at night. So she gave mm. me a key and I would just like have dinner with the family, be with them there after school, have dinner with them. And then around seven o'clock at night, I'd be like, okay, daddy's doing bedtime tonight. I love you guys. I'll see you in the morning. And I would go to the office in this building and it was like an empty office mall because all the businesses shut down at five. And so I'd let myself in. Creeped and be like, out? No, the janitor, I always scared him because he would not <laughs> expect there to be anybody there. And then this custodian would walk in to empty the garbage and be like, oh, sorry, <laughs> he'd be so panicked because it's like random woman in the office. But I would do that probably once a week, once every other week, depending on how busy I was. And I would sit there for like three, four, five hours, depending on the night. I would just have a big coffee and I would just work as much as I could. So, but again, like that's the privilege of like, my mom happened to own an office that she wasn't using in the evening. Right. That was like 20 minutes from my house so I could get there. But I, I'm not good at writing, like just sitting down in the afternoon and working on a book. And I'm writing my second book right now and I'm doing the same thing where it's like, I go like, okay, I need a little time away. And it's really, yeah. I, I hesitate to, part of me wants to explain that to people because I like the transparency of like, if it's hard for you to be writing a book, like that's normal. It was hard for me too. And I like part of the reason I can do it is this like privilege I have to kind of go away. And then the other part of me is just kind of like a little embarrassed where it's like, oh yeah, like I can't even work in my own house. <laughs> no, I don't yeah. think that's embarrassing at all. Maybe just because I'm the exact same way. So yeah, I, I think, I think if you don't have the privilege of being able to get away, you have to find what is the equivalent for that for you. Like, can you, for sure. what is your escape? What allows you to focus? Mm -hmm. And it's, probably way harder if you don't have an office to go to or a, a partner who can help so take hard. that yeah. burden off but I get it I absolutely get that that's just my brain doesn't work here for yeah. some reason with some things like you were talking about copywriting or like I can do show notes and graphics and copywriting and whatever I can do that with the like, chaos spinning around me but I can't yes, work much. on my book yeah but maybe that's the thing right like I do work from home like eight hours a day at least and so yeah. like when I say that I do on magazine articles or copywriting or like whatever mm -hmm. writing project outside of the book it was just exclusively the book that I had to get away for because yeah. it felt like a completely different project and a different part of my brain and I don't need to have that conversation with myself in that quiet time and that mm -hmm. reflection whereas like right now we're recording this podcast and I'm in my home office and like my kids are somewhere in the house and I'm just like that's fine you know what I mean <laughs> I can do other stuff at home with the kids around yeah. I work all day here it's cool oh, you have such an interesting chapter about the contrast of men and women yes. I don't know do, I we, really... do we have do you want to dive into that Missy well <laughs> maybe we can keep it short but it's something I've thought about so many times is that it's so different for men. And you, I think Suzanne, you maybe said, or I don't remember which one of you said, joking, like where people would say, who's taking care of your kids mm -hmm. while you're off working? Um, mm -hmm. Men don't get that question. So you're really yeah. honest about this contrast and how this is, how society treats men and women. And so I'm just wondering if you've really discovered some best practices for 
how to integrate this dynamic of division of labor and managing child hair, child hair, child care <laughs> together. <laughs> My God, uh, managing child care and that division of labor. Like how does that play out and what have you learned? So it's been a transition, I think, in my household because things have transitioned, like in terms of like the responsibilities we've had and how we've been working in the age of our kids. So when we first mm -hmm. had kids, my husband was working full time and I was the at home parent who was just like freelancing a little. So yeah. I took on pretty much like everything in terms of just that invisible workload and that mental workload. Yes. And my husband was completely engaged and like a really, really good dad. And he'd come home and immediately it was all about the kids. And he was never the kind of guy who would hesitate to like change a diaper and do whatever. So when he was there, he was all in, but he was gone all day and he commuted. So I mm -hmm. got really into a routine of just being like, well, I'm just going to do everything. And like when he's home, he can help. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I went back to work, I think it was hard for both of us to some extent to kind of shift out of that mindset yep. um, because he would do anything, but it would be like anything I asked. Like, it would be like, if I was like, oh, like our son needs a haircut. Yeah. Can you take him? And I, I've made him an appointment. Can you just take him to the appointment? Like, of yep. course he would. But what I, my goal was, you know, what I want to see is my husband going, oh, like our son's hair is getting kind of shaggy. I'm going to book an appointment and just say to you, like, mm -hmm. I'm taking him to get a haircut. Like, I don't want to have to notice it, book it, and then tell you when the appointment is and then be like, oh, you took them and like clap. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I'm really lucky. Like my husband is very much like, as soon as you point something like that out, he's like, oh yeah, that's a problem. And he'll adjust it. I realize not everybody has that kind of partner or a partner at all. Um, mm -hmm. But in our house, what I found was as soon as I addressed it and was like, have you noticed <laughs> this? Uh -huh. He was almost like embarrassed. Or he'd be like, oh, why do I expect you to do that? Like he said to me uh, not too long ago, he said something about, oh, the kids' snow pants don't fit anymore. And I went like, cool. And he's like, oh, yeah, sorry. That was that was kind of not cool. Because he was thinking like, he he just did it without thinking, like telling me the snow pants don't fit, like yeah. expecting mm -hmm. that I would go so get go ahead and take care of that. Then like, good for noticing. Go go get new snow pants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can do that as well as I can. We both work full time. We're both in here. Yeah. But as soon as you yeah. call him out, yeah, he's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's a gift. I have a partner like that too. Like I. Yeah. It's taken like, some learning and some training for both of us. For both of ways, us. Yeah, but, yeah. Yes. But yeah, I used to make all these lists for him, and I resented it. Like you would not believe. And then yeah. I realized he is not a baby. I am not his mother. We're doing this together. Like, let's talk about it. And we have figured it out. And yeah. You're and you can do things differently is the thing I had to yes. remember is like, you don't have to do things my way just because mm -hmm. like I'm that parent that's been doing this thing for the past five years or seven years. You can do it your way as long as it's yeah. still working. Like you don't have to mimic my style of running the household. Like no. we do I would say like when way. I go away, like as long as I come home and everyone's alive and fed and has gotten where they needed to be. Great. I don't need to know like, the details. I don't yeah. even want to know the details. <laughs> Just don't yeah. even tell me. I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> oh my God. I love it. Oh, well, I'm oh, hoping right. that you get to get away again soon. Are you going to go to mom two this year? Are we going to get to see you? I am. Yeah. I've got oh, a ticket uh, for was it Scottsdale, um, yes. which is exciting. I've never been to Arizona. Um, and I'm actually going away in about 10 days. I'm going away for two days to continue working on the second book. So um, yeah, That's I'm awesome. going to do some writing. And then hopefully when I see you in Arizona, I will be like, hey, I've actually got a book on the way. Oh my gosh. You have to send us a picture of you in your hotel and we'll include it in the show notes when we publish next week. Just me alone in my sweatpants yes. in my nice hotel room. That's what it usually looks like. Oh yeah. yeah. We need the inspiration. We need the inspiration. That is very inspiring. I mean, I literally made a note while we were talking like book room. Yes. Yeah. And for anybody who is watching this on the YouTube channel, I'm putting the book up here. Mm -hmm. It's the cover so gorgeous. Send me I into love the week cover. alone. Just love it. And so, um, yeah, I can't wait to see the next book. Um, and where can people find you and the book? So the book, um, I, I'm being mindful of you guys are in the States and I'm not. So in the States, uh, it's through Barnes and Noble and most independent bookstores. The thing is, I would say, Whereas if you walk into a bookstore in Canada, it's like on the shelves in a lot of the U.S. bookstores, you have to ask for it because it's in the warehouses. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just, the, you know, life as a Canadian independent author. So my <laughs> book is available there, but you maybe can't walk into the store and find it. You'd have to ask for it and it would get there in okay. two or three days. It's available online as well. 
And people can find me on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and pretty much everything is just my name, Erin Peffler or Erin Peffler Writer. We'll put it all in the show notes. We know where to find you. Hope you, you find so we'll me. It all <laughs> yes, we'll, <laughs> we'll direct people to you. So, okay. Awesome. So we're, um, and you're still good if we go like for the look, listen, learns? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Awesome. We'll do a speed round. <laughs> We're never speedy. It's my fault kidding? that I'm the one who's chatty, right? Like, oh I'm no, I was talking to you for so hours great. about my about <laughs> the college admissions process. But yes. <laughs> All right. So it is time for the look, listen, mm -hmm. learns. If anybody is new here, welcome. We're so glad to have you here. And the end of each show we'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about our look listen learn so things mm -hmm. that we are reading or watching or learning about and we don't like to put our guests in the hot seat so missy do you want to kick it off sure so well i looked this week last night or the night before i think the night before at chelsea handler's latest special revolution and i have thoughts like a lot of thoughts on it i will not share them all here because we're oh. trying to go quickly it no, was that's... funny <laughs> It was funny. Well, okay. On a scale of one to 10, like uh, on a scale of one to 10, it was like a nine funny. I thought like she oh. made me laugh. And a couple of times I laughed out loud, which is a, always a, That's a good indicator sign. that mm -hmm. things are good. But, but also this week in the news, she has been in the news quoted as saying she did not know she was taking a weight loss drug. Oh, she I didn't know. know she was on Ozempic that she was that her injecting doctor just, herself with. Right. It's a process. If you're on something like that, there are injections and she just her doctor just hands it out and I'm like this is such an uncool thing to say on so many levels it's yeah so that's a whole nother podcast we could talk about all the problems with that so I was I frustrated that, that she had made me laugh and then that happened and in the special <laughs> she admitted it has to be a joke I swear if this is not a joke I am scared for our whole society she said she was in her 40s before she realized that the sun and the moon were different things she no. thought yeah. just in the daytime it was a sun and at nighttime it was a moon and it no. fed into this joke and it <laughs> made you know like i'm like she has to be making this up but she acted like she was not and she has some pretty unsettling history with dog rescue like she she's made some mistakes and gives these dogs back they have good homes but she just seems to make oh, funny no. decisions that make for great comedy but oh, i don't know i don't know um, but I did think it was funny. She talks a lot about the choice not to have kids. And I joked with our friends over text, like, it doesn't sound that awful. <laughs> like, it sounds kind of <laughs> nice sometimes. <laughs> I, mean, I can laugh. I get where she's coming from. I can put myself in that place. Yeah. So anyway, I looked at that this week. And then I am listening to Chatter. I did not write down the author before I came in here. But um, one of our former guests, Kate Swamy, recommended it. And it is so good. It's about like, what happens in our brain when we start telling ourselves all of this stuff and we start listening to the chatter oh, instead yeah. of I having some control over that. Yeah. yeah. It's really, really good. Um, so yeah, those are my look and listen, and I'm going to save my learn for another time because I haven't finished learning it. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, a work in progress. Yeah, I'm a work in progress for sure. Oh, we all are. Um, okay, so for me, so I'm reading two books right now, and I tend to have like a novel and a nonfiction on the go. So like, depending on my mood, I can't do two novels, my brain can't handle two different plots, but I can do a no. novel and a nonfiction. Um, so do you guys know Anne-Marie McDonald? She's really big mm -hmm. in Canada. I have no sense of like, if she's big in the States, but she wrote Fall on Your Knees and The Way the Crow Flies. So I'm reading her novel, Fame, which is amazing. Uh, it's huge though. It's like over 700 pages. So I've okay. really committed and I'm getting it a lot of my time, but um, I love it. And she's just such a magical writer and a beautiful writer. And so I'm really, really enjoying that. So it's called Fame. Okay. And then the other thing I'm reading is The Baby on the Fire Escape by Julie Phillips. Oh my gosh. Did you guys read that one? <gasps> no. That just gave my body an actual reaction. <laughs> I know. Did you just like, <gasps> oh, Save you have to read it. Okay. So it is about, um, oh, I don't even think I can do it justice, but it is about writers and artists and women who are in creative roles or who are just creatives and that conflict between being a mother and being a creative. Oh, and the title, The Baby in the Fire Escape, comes from this rumor that was spread about this woman where they're like, people were like, oh, she puts her baby out on the fire escape so she can paint. And oh then I don't know that it was true. Um, and I don't think it was, but it was something where that shaming of like women for like right. taking time to themselves to focus on their art. Right. So she's uh, talking about lots of different people and giving all these examples. And it's really, really interesting about like that. the women who 
couldn't handle being a mom and an artist or who gave up their art for their kids or who gave up mothering for their art and like all these different like things that happened over history but that conflict that doesn't exist with men right like like right. it's just a conflict for, for women especially kind of a lot of these examples are from like you know the 1800s early 1900s maybe like even just 50 40 years ago so anyway that's been fascinating the baby on the fire yes, escape yes. by julie okay, Phillips. on the list Yes. I think she's an American author. Um, and then for my, what I'm watching right now. So I love a good murder show, like many women. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like during the winter, my husband and I have kind of exhausted all of these murder shows on Netflix where we're like, okay, we've seen all of those like Harlan <laughs> Coben ones that are just crazy, with like a million yes. plot points and, you know, they're yeah. entertaining and we just had exhausted them. So now we've moved on to Scandinavian murder shows that are like Ooh. closed captioned in English. I was going to oh. say, is it in English? Oh my God. Cause we speak, obviously no, like, you know, one of them is um, Icelandic, one of them is Danish. Another one we watched is Finnish. So we speak none of those languages, but it's all captioned. <laughs> And they're really good, like kind of, I don't even know how to describe them. It's like watching like great episodes of like Law and Order, but yeah. finish. Um, and they're usually <laughs> six episodes, eight episodes. So we watched one called Chestnut Man, which was uh, Danish. We watched one called Trapped, which was uh, Icelandic. And then we watched the first season of Dead Wind, which is Finnish. And now we keep joking, like we're going to just start speaking all these Scandinavian languages. But like, <laughs> truly, we have no idea what they're saying. And everything, especially, um, I think it was Danish. I was like, I can't even separate the words. I have oh, no idea yeah. what's happening. So I really rely on the post captioning. But they're, I have they're a hard time even if someone has a British accent. So yeah, I, I can't oh, yeah. even imagine. A we use closed captioning for a lot of things that are in English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no judgment. Yeah, oh so that's what that's what I'm into right now. Is I'm watching like Finnish murder mysteries and I'm reading about the baby list. on the fire escape and this beautiful, beautiful novel by Anne Marie McDonald. That's so amazing. It well, it is funny. I feel, especially after both my husband and I had COVID, I feel like we did. We ran out of shows and we just mm -hmm. started last night. It's always sunny in Philadelphia because we've never. So we love to watch these shows that have like 10 seasons. Like they started. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're looking at the clothes and just the technology and stuff. Yes. Like, I don't even know if they had cell phones back then when they started this show. Oh, that's that's so funny. I've so never funny. Seen it. It's so irreverent. It's just oh, my God. Well, ridiculous. The first, just the first episode, I was like, oh, my God. It's like the what is it called it's like we get a little bit racist or something i was like oh god oh, oh no. god <laughs> yeah. and it is just so cringe every mm -hmm. oh it's yeah. so cringy but it's it's also there was a few laugh out loud moments so we'll, we'll keep going we've just one episode <laughs> in we got a whole journey ahead of us yeah that's not, so that's not even yeah, my look that's not even yeah what is your look listen okay what is it okay so my look i'm we're still doing we had laura vanderkamp on a couple uh -huh. weeks ago and we're doing her tranquility by tuesday and her time tracking that's a lot of teas um so i finally i have my little my we talked about this my campus mm -hmm. japanese it's a yeah. spiral notebook but that you can open like a three ring notebook so you can mm -hmm. move things around and you can also then print out your own pages. So I have designed, I've, you can see, I did not do very good here with my time tracking. Um, <laughs> but so I have now my time tracking on one side because I know you're supposed to do it on Excel or digitally or whatever, right. but I'm just not a digital. Like, it doesn't work for bonkers. you. It doesn't work for you. It doesn't. Like, I need yeah, to have it where too. I can just write. And I even, I set my watch to go off every 30 minutes because I was losing so many hours and not figuring out like what I had done. So just every half yeah. hour it goes beep. And then I do just write That's down. Smart. Um, That's smart. And then I have a I whole time. thing down here, which mm -hmm. is just, I had been trying to make it pretty like, here's my to do's, here's my priorities, here's my whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I just gave up after two days. I was like, nope, it's just a bunch of lines and I'll figure out later which was which. And then I take the things that are important from here. And then I put it onto a, just a big page that I can move along the weeks with me that's like a to-do list so i think awesome. this is going to work i'm really excited so i love um, that i'm working on i've been spending a lot of time looking at that um i am listening to the lost children archive which is kind of interesting because you mentioned about how men may not think the same way about their creative pursuits and like whatever yeah. but it's kind of a story about this dude well and the wife but he's decided he needs to go like record the sounds and the stories of certain native american cultures in arizona okay. 
And so they're driving basically from the East Coast to Arizona. And it's this, you know, basically the story going on in this wife's head about like, I guess he's just going to move for two years and like trying to decide who's got the most important job, who needs these kids. One of them is one of their kids and one is the other. And, you know, they're uh -uh. each other's stepkids and like, uh -huh. okay, are both the kids going to live with her now so he can have his peace and quiet? And like, it's just, it's a very, it's very interesting. It's for the book club who, that I forgot to read the book for last yeah. time or that I didn't know <laughs> what the book was last time. So I am, <laughs> the book club isn't for like another six weeks, but I'm almost done with this book already. <laughs> I'm going to be on top of it. Um, is it fiction? It is fiction. Okay. I it thought you said fiction. it was. And then I was like, wait, are these real people? Yes. Right. And I'm listening to it. Um, and it's, I don't know. It, I was telling my friend Allison on our walk, I listened to it for our entire eight mile run last week, which took way more time than it should have. I was like, and so far they've basically just packed up the cars, right? <laughs> so, so it's, it's a real Long. thinker. It's a real mm -hmm. thinker. So like you are really spending a lot of time in her thoughts mm -hmm. versus actions. Um, but yeah. it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. I haven't read anything like it for a while. Um, and what am I learning? Did I already talk to you about Upstairs Circus? I feel like I already shared this. No, but I, another friend just recently, it's very funny how life works, Did brought it up and we are talking about trying to find a time to go. Okay. Well, I think this should be one of our fun things that we do. Yes. Like if we get people together here in Austin Yeah, and my, meetups. I made this little clutch. Look at how it. cute it is that? A handle on it. It's it cute. has a snap. But yeah, so it's a like a do-it-yourself crafts and bar in hmm. downtown Austin. So that was just kind oh, of nice. a getting out of my, I usually would be too worried about like, oh, I'm not going to do it right. Or where do I go? Where yeah. do I park? <laughs> my number one problem of anything, where do I park? Where did uh, you park? I, I parked right across at a parking meter. It worked out perfectly. Um, yeah, it's but, lucky. I know my friend Janine and Diane had this great idea to go there. And my friend Diane actually owns Austin Craft Lounge, uh, oh, which yes. is on the south side of Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really it a cool space for all kinds of creative people, mm -hmm. mostly women owned businesses. But then also you can go in and make some of your own stuff. So I don't know if she was just checking out the competition or maybe <laughs> or supporting the competition, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but it was really fun. So I got to make my little leather handbag. Love and... what you made. Yeah, you only need the picture for the show notes. Yes, I will take a picture of that. Yeah. So yes, that was one of my learns awesome. that I could branch out and do something creative and a little right brain. Yeah, I love it. And with my my, big, my very own hands. Although <laughs> I have two of these straps because I did it wrong once and the guy I was like, can I have another strap? And they do. They're, <laughs> they're very kind if you mess up. So yeah, upstairs circus. Oh, that's so great. All right. Well, we could talk to you for two days, Erin, I think. And I'm so glad we get to talk to you in Scottsdale. So oh, I really appreciate you having me on it. Oh, well, I'm Thank so you again. glad we get to see you at Mom too. So good to see you. And it's like, Missy, I look forward to meeting you in person. Yes, me too. Take All care. Right. Bye, y'all. See you soon. Bye. Bye. You too. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us for the Mom and Dot 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 podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's show, and if you know someone else who could benefit from the episode, please be sure and share it with them. And while we're begging, please subscribe and rate us wherever it is you listen to podcasts. You can find links to all the things we discussed today in our show notes or over at our website, momandpodcast.com, with the A and D spelled out. In between shows, find us over at the socials, including our private Mom and Community Facebook group. The links to that group and all of our socials can be found at mommanpodcast.com. Thank you so much for your support. We appreciate you more than you know. Now go out there and make your ellipses count.